We're live. Can you hear me? Oh, yes. Oh, there you go. Okay. Hey. Sorry. So I you're good. talking to me or not. We were having issues with Gannon. So, okay. Well, there we go. We appreciate. Sorry. Sorry for taking uh, a little bit of your time to get, having you on, but we appreciate you jumping on, brother. How are how you doing? Good, good. No worries. I just got practice today at Idlewild, practice the course, and I'm just uh, here in uh, Kentucky. Yeah. So, first question you know, how's the injury? How, how's the body? What's, what's the update out there? Yeah, so shoulders, all right, not great, but uh, I would say it's like probably before Ledgestone, it was real bad. Um, after going into the, we'll kind of back up, going to like before the final round of the Estonian tournament, that's when I kind of tweaked the shoulder. I'd been playing like eight weeks in a row, no breaks, and just kind of my shoulder just kind of like, you know, I tweaked it and my body's just like, hey, you got to take a break. That's kind of what my body was telling me. Uh, and so I took that, I, so I took the week off for Ledgestone, just listen to the body. And, and so this week's a lot better, but it's probably definitely not a hundred percent. It doesn't feel like the type of injury that where it's gonna, it's not like I tore anything or anything like that. It's just more of just, you know, an overuse strain type thing. And, um, and so, yeah, it's probably like 80, 80 to 90% somewhere in that range. So no, no worries in, uh, leading up to worlds being, being close to a hundred percent. Yeah, so I think that since we have kind of an off, not really, I mean, it's not really an off week, but a practice week before Worlds, I think that I'm just going to be able to kind of um, play it by ear and see um, how I feel for, for that week. So I'm just going to, I want to play at least one more tournament before Worlds just to kind of um, gauge my, gauge where my game's at and kind of be able to kind of use that practice week to can maybe work on things that I, you know, did well or didn't do well and just kind of overall judge my game. And so I think that having that tournament beforehand is, is a good way to judge. So you were, uh, yeah, we'll go back a little bit. You were one shot away pretty much from having the European swing completely just dominating. Um, what, what were, what was it about the courses over in Europe? You know, we, I heard a lot of people talk about it. What were about the courses over in Europe that kind of like either suited your game or you really enjoyed playing? Like what, what, what did you learn from those courses compared to the States? And is there room for improvement in tournaments and course design that we have currently in the States? Yeah. So I think that for, um, the, we'll just start with kind of my game personally, then I'll work into like the, the course design in general. But for me, it was just, you know, I think preserve, like once I hit preserve, I really started to find my game. And, and so that was kind of the, the breaking point for me where I really started gaining some confidence and really was onto some, some good things with my swing and my putt and everything. And, and so I was able to start that in at, at the preserve. And then it was kind of just, you know, happened to be uh, that I was in Europe when my game has been feeling really well. So I think that's a big part of it for me as a player. If I can, I feel like that's something I'm, I'm good at. I'm good at kind of, you know, morphing my game to fit whatever course we're playing, whatever style course, whether it's open, wooded, you know, that kind of thing. And so I think that's something I've been really good at over the years. And I think that, you know, I just kind of over there, it's, it's a, it's a good mix. I think you got the, you know, you got for the major, you had the, the, uh, Tampa Bay disc golf center, which is, you know, real wooded tight, kind of like Northwoods blackish. And then you have, the beast, which is USDGC style with, you know, OB all, all over the place. And, and so you got the major pressure. So it's just got a lot of the, I would say USDGC feel. I think that's what UC went for when he was designing that course from what, it, from, an, from my standpoint, that's kind of what it feels like is he wanted to get that feel. So, so yeah, that's kind of where my game was at. And it just, you know, happened to line up with the Europe swing really well. And then, and then as far as the design over there, it's, it's, yeah, it's, it's definitely different. You know, Norway was a lot, it was like a golf course, but it was, on, it was a golf course in the woods. It was really weird. Uh, not weird, but it was a, a great sick. design. I really enjoyed it. Yeah. I think it was the top five course that I've played just for the oh, variety wow. of shots that you, 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 one of the few courses you pull out every disc, you pull out a flippy fairway, you pull out a flippy driver, you're pulling out forehands, you know, you have to have speed control coming into, you know, sloped greens all that stuff so it just challenges every shot and so i think that that was a big reason why a lot of players really enjoyed that specific course yeah that one filmed really well too like it looked really good on coverage uh which i think made a lot of people really enjoy watching um that tournament um okay so we're, we're kind of talking right now you know let's remove your injury 
you're right now kind of what you would say playing really, really good disc golf, right? You're, you're, you're getting into tournaments, you're either winning them or you're getting right in contention there at the very end. If you could kind of go back and look at how good you've been playing throughout your entire career, where would you put like yourself right now? Do you see yourself playing the best disc golf you've ever played? Or do you look back five, 10 years ago and be like, ah, I still need a little bit more to get back to where I used to be. Yeah, no, I think that right now where I'm, where my game is at, I'm playing at a level to where, you know, when, when me and Paul were having our historic battles, that's kind of where I'm at. I think that you're know, like 2016, 2017. I think that that's kind of the consistently at the high level and not just playing a good round here and there. And, and, and then, you know, it's like, it's like, Hey, I'm shooting 12 under, and then following up with another 11, 12 under the next round, you know? And I think that that's kind of at the top level of disc golf. That's what you got. You can't shoot a 12 under 13 under, and then follow it up with a five under. You have to follow it up with at least another nine, 10 under, if you want to stay in the lead. And so I think that's kind of the biggest difference is that's where my game is at. I'm, I feel like I'm can consistently shoot those numbers uh, just based on the fact that, you know, my shots are coming out, my hand very clean and you know pretty much on the lines that i really want to and and then on top of that having that that creates huge confidence and you know under pressure situations and i think that's the most important thing is being ready for those situations and being confident knowing that your shots are going to do exactly what you want when when the pressure's on and i think that that's that's important that's that's how you win tournaments and that's how you you know play at a high level for a long time really what uh what was kind of going on those early rounds at the European open? Because, you know, if you're fans of Ricky and you watch Ricky play pretty much like cool, calm, collected throughout the beginning rounds. And then as we get closer and closer to the final round, we start seeing the Raptor legs. We start seeing a little of the running in the fist pumps, the talking that was happening like day one at the European open. So, like, did you just have a different mindset going into that tournament of, like, how important that one was? Yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, it, uh, for me, I think I treated the, the Tampa Bay Disc Golf Center is the type of course to where, you know, you – you know, you always hear people say, oh, you can't, you can't win, uh, win the tournament day one or, you know, or that style of course, just because of how tight and narrow it is. But it is the type of course to where you can, you can go there and sh through and shoot eight, nine, seven, eight, nine under something that, in that range. And then the next round feel like you threw very similar shots and was just a tiny bit off and shoot one over. So that's the kind of course it is. And I just kind of knew that I wanted, you know, I wanted to just stay, you know, right. Basically what I shot, I shot two five unders. Of course, I would have liked to got a little bit more out of those first couple rounds, but I knew that staying in it those first two days and then going over to the beast, uh, is, is a little lot as a lot more scorable and it's not as punishing. You know, if you go out of bounds, you can still save your par on some of the par fours and par fives. Uh, out there at the beast. Whereas you go out, you know, you hit a tree and go off the fairway. It's an automatic bogey or double out there yeah. at Tampa Bay disc golf center. So it's almost, you feel like you're handcuffed a little bit. It's that style of course where you're, you're handcuffed in the fact that you, you don't want to go for too much and, and bite off too much and get too aggressive out of position. If you, if you throw a bad shot, it's, there's no scrambling. You just pitch to the fairway and try to get up and down from where you would normally land your drive. Um, that kind of golf, you know, it's, it's like you practice you just a lot of different spots. You're throwing to different spots. And if, you know, for me, if you don't hit that spot off the fairway on a par four, let's say, and you bounce in the woods, now you're just pitching to that spot where you normally would throw your drive and trying to get up and down for the par instead of the birdie. And so that's just, and there's a lot of, you know, there's, there's holes out there that par is a great score at Tampa Bay disc golf center. And so I think that's a great challenge for the pros. And I think that it's great for a major and it's going to be great for worlds. I'm really excited to see, to, to play that course and really get challenged by it because you, it's, you definitely have to respect the course. Uh, every time you go out there in every hole, you have to, um, respect it and know that it, it can, it can bite you. So I think that that's what, what I love about it. What were your thoughts on the greens over there? You know, being one of the top, putters on tour having having the greens as difficult as they were with the different elevation changes the roll away potential do you do you see or do you hope more courses more more course designers look at that course and see how it plays around the greens and say hey we need to do more of this 
Yeah, so I think it's it's funny how that works actually. Like when you have raised greens and stuff like that, it actually what it does is it puts a premium on on driving as opposed to putting because it's like if you're you know for someone you know for me I've always that's where I've always feel like I've I'm I'm you know gain a lot of my strokes is putting and so but I think it it allows you to it's it's like. Like let's say hole eighteen at Tampa Disc Golf yeah. Center, it's, you basically throw it inside. The, there's like a you know let's say tw- thirty foot circle. If you don't throw it inside that thirty foot circle, you pretty much can't run your putt because essentially if you miss the putt, there's no you're going to automatically roll away to you know you might not even three putt, you might four putt if you if you keep going for that putt. So so it actually puts more of a uh, premium on driving as opposed to putting just based on the the slopes of the greens and the as much like you said roll away potential and and you know if you don't throw a good drive you're just laying up you're not even you're not going to be able to slam in a 40 50 footer on that green you can of course but you know it's it's just more a lot less likely that people are going to run putts like that if you have that danger and so i think i actually like that i think it, it really forces you to to be more clean off the tee in order to get those birdies. And so, yeah, I think hole 18 is one. They have like a short par three that the basket's perched way up on top of a hill, but yep. it's short. Like I said, it's only 320, something like that. So it's very reachable, but you have to put it in the right, the basically the, the left side of the green. If you don't put put it, uh, throw your disc to the left side of the green, there's a, there's a down slope, you're going to roll away. And love that. And hole. so it just, yeah, it just, I, I think that it's great that it forces you to play you know, like, like ball golf, you're playing to the fat side of the green, you're, you know, and, and, and that's a good shot. You're not, you know, you're not pin hunting on some of the holes that you're not. And you, of course you still can, but it's a lot less likely if you have a, you go two feet to the right of the basket, you know, you're, you're going to be 60 feet away by the time your disc stops rolling. And so, yeah, I just, I just think it's, it's a great touch to a disc golf design. And I think that you know, UC's always been kind of taking that next step and staying staying ahead of the game when it comes to designing courses. And I, I think he did a great job there. I you think, think that that's like ahead, more yeah. of where you want the major championships to be is more premium on driving rather than than putting. Or or do you uh, like kind of going to a course like let's say the Beast, which is kind of you know back in the day that used to be like the hardest course we played. It was it was the same thing that you're saying. You miss your shot left, you're going out of bounds, and now it's kind of becoming like you got to shoot 10 to 12 under per round out there. And now Tampa, you like, like you said, more of a premium on driving. Do you think that that's a better challenge for the major championships or do you like the combo or, or would you rather see it a little bit of both? Yeah. I, I I like, uh, to be honest, if I had the choice, I would say Tampa Bay disc golf center from a strictly a player standpoint, I think that would be the best course. Um, but I think, you know, mixing in the spectator friendly, and it's not that the beast is a bad course, but if you're comparing them to, and I'm comparing the two and I have to pick, I would definitely say Tampa Bay. I think it's, it's so fair, but yet so challenging. And it, and that's hard to do in a course. It's hard to make a course challenging for the top professional players without making it Mando here, clown's mouth here and all that other stuff. It's, they don't use that. There's nothing like you, you can still throw your shot and shape your shot. However you want to, to get to the green. On like I said that for example that par three 320 feet you could throw a forehand you could throw a putter you could throw mid range you could throw a driver right into the hill and try to stick it into the hill if you wanted to like so there's just five different shot shapes you could throw without having to force you to you know like I said you know put mandos and stuff everywhere so I just think that you know the only thing problem with that place is it's not very spectator friendly. And yeah. so that's, I think the big problem is, and why they want to use the beast still. And, and the beast is a great course. It's still, it really is. Um, but, um, but yeah, I, I just think it's, it, it combines the, and I, I guess to answer your question. Yeah. I think that the driving over there is, is, is definitely the, the most important part of your game. If you want to pick one, which is not very often, you can say that because most courses you just right. throw, you know, preserve, throw it wherever you want and make some putts and you're going to shoot good scores, you know? <laughs> and, and so your driving really isn't a premium out there. It's, it's just not, I mean, of course you still have to throw good shots relatively, but Decent, yeah. yeah. If your putter's on fire though, on courses like that, yeah. you it doesn't matter. score. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Right. You're just going to be getting a par, you know, you know, you're not going to be getting bogeys. If you don't throw good drives, you're just getting a par. Yeah, I think the first course I can figure out how to have like a treehouse zip line <laughs> is going to go to the next level because then you can just have all the spectators up in the trees looking down and that would be incredible. So we'll see if anyone can For out sure. there can figure that out. 
Uh, next thing I want to talk about, this actually just recently happened. Uh, you have now become the number one all time on the money list. What, like, what does that mean to you? I, I think it's, it's pretty cool. Obviously the money's great, but I think it's just a cool stat to be, you know, I think that's something that in our game, that's really cool that you can have stats and you can, and you can be, you know, for me, have something to strive for and be proud of. That's something that's, I think just a sign of consistency. And, you know, it's not, of course the money's however, whatever the dollar number is, is, is great. But I think it's just more of like the, the fact of like the bar, like, Hey, that's the bar. And that's kind of a cool number. Now the next generation Gannon can have something to shoot for whenever, uh, he's playing year in and year out. And once he gets to that point, it's going to be, you know, cool for him to shoot for that. And so I think that if, you know, it's, if nothing else, it's, it's like I said, it's a cool stat that we can sh share with the disc golf world and, and create storylines, you know, Hey, maybe Paul will pass me and, you know, sometime Go soon and, and then forth. we can kind of battle it out. And so, yeah, it's just, it just adds some cool, you know, cool storylines, I think for our sport that, you know, would definitely helps, get, you know, create hype. Yeah, get it now because it's definitely going to be hard to get in the future as these uh, persons get more and more. Yeah, exactly. I don't, I don't think you were playing for $15,000 your first couple no. of years on no. tour. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I think Gannon's going to pass me this year. <laughs> and I'm in, I'm, I think I'm still in the top 10 for highest money earnings, and he's going to pass yeah, so me this year. He's over 100K he's this year already. Yeah, <laughs> That's crazy. That's Man. wild. Yeah. Nutty, you know, like nutty. That tournament 12, 10 years ago would be like, Two grand, you know, be massive yeah. too. Yeah. Everyone be going yeah. driving yeah. from everywhere to play it. Uh -huh. Um, I don't know if we've done this yet, Ricky. Uh, this might be the first time, but Edwin loves our stats guy, loves to make these kind of like Madden ranking rankings, if you will. Uh, so we're gonna throw it up here and see what you think of it. Th these are your Madden rankings. He's okay. got he's got your scoring at 98, your okay. power at 96, accuracy at 97 scramble at 99 and putting at 98 your rank on the D, uh, disc golf pro tour is number two okay and uh your overall is 98 and that is uh i i edwin can fact check me i believe that's the highest that we've seen okay i like um, it i think i think to be honest that's very accurate i think i think um <laughs> i think yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, 90, well, yeah high 90, 90s yeah, yeah high me. 90s is great yeah well, that's fine well, i'm saying the power is like i'm not like the farthest thrower but i definitely have you know power but i'm not that's like I the say only I'm, one that's not statistical backing everything yeah. else is statistical back in yeah, okay that makes sense and like i said power i think it's it's i think if you did stats and you did you know just looking you know at like you know you did the eye test i think i would be you know because i'm not really quite inside the top 10 i would say i'm probably right around you I know i don't think there's anybody who throws farther than you on the course i think that that is yeah a, yeah you were I think throwing that's a like secret 700 that you feet on whole 18 <laughs> i think you it's a secret that people try to keep you down because you have the flashy ab and gannon's right. throwing it so far it looks like right. effortlessly you go down the fairway farther than anybody yeah i think i can throw line drive shots like just like real like low calvin. golf shots yeah. yeah you and calvin yeah, yeah very calvin's similar. really good at it too but we don't have like and I, for me like i don't really i just don't have the high over the top as much i mean yeah. i just can't do it when i need to i just you know i don't it's just not a shot i throw that much but yeah i think it's like the AB hardest shot has to that. practice go to a field and then th you have to go chase your dish no, for thank 700 you. feet yeah. <laughs> like Nobody wants to practice that. Right. Yeah. No, for sure. No, that's cool. I think that's, yeah, that's, I would say that's pretty accurate. I'm just trying to think of anything. Um, yeah, the second, maybe, the second my highest accuracy was might DOS. be a little lower. I think my accuracy might be like a 95, 96. So I think you'd subtract a couple points on accuracy because sometimes I can get a little shaky off the tee, but um, yeah, overall, I think that's, that's good. Yeah. Not, not too shabby at all. No. Um, If you're cool with it now, I would love to, you were at Ledgestone, so I would love to pick your brain a little bit at some of the stuff that went down on Ledge, at Ledgestone and, and hear kind of what you think. And then also, Yuli, you, you chime in too, because you were what you watched and walked, but you didn't play. So Ledgestone this year was very, very interesting. A little, a little shaky, I will say, <laughs> um, with some of the stuff that went down. So the first thing I want to say and again, hand up. I would say this if this didn't if this didn't happen to me, but this one actually did happen to me. Uh, so it's a little near dear to my heart. Hole one is a made up rule. We've just decided to make up a rule. If you throw your tee shot on hole one into the baseball field, 
you get to go all the way down there and take it to where it was last in bounds. If you throw your shot in the middle of the lake, you go to the drop zone. That makes a whole lot of sense to me. I'm completely fine with that. That makes sense. Your disc never crossed in bounds. It was in the water the whole time. You got to go to the drop zone. My disc hit the ground on the other side and then cut rolled back into the water. I was walking. I was already down by the basketball courts. And I hear my group behind me be like, hey, hey, I think you have to go to the drop zone. I'm like, what? I was like, no, I'm not going to drop zone. Jit. I did that lot yesterday. I'm not going back there. And it's like, I'm reading the rules. It says any disc that ends up in the water has to throw from the drop zone. That is a made up rule to force, to force someone that crossed in bounds or hit in bounds to have to go to the drop zone. You have to make that like an Island to where right. any shot that go, does not land in bounds or cross in bounds has to go. But they made it up a rule to where a certain shot is allowed to advance and then other shots aren't allowed to advance. What are your thoughts right now with disc golf and how hole to hole, you almost have to read a paragraph on how to play the hole because every <laughs> hole is different. What are your thoughts on that? Uh, yeah, that that is I think that that's kind of been a thing in our sport is like there's so many different people making rules for every course that we go to. You got and it's nothing against the people that are making the rules. It's just like there's always going to be some, you know, something they maybe didn't think about. Let's say there's Steve Dodge at Maple Hill is making rules and you got Nate Heinold, you know, and these people might not even be making the rules. I'm just throwing out the names just in general with whoever is at the course that could potentially make the rules. So sure. for me, just thinking out loud, it's like, so you have, you know, each TD or each person does, you know, making the rules for that course, you know, and, and, and everyone could be in, like you said, different wording that could be taken certain ways. Like you said, like with at Maple Hill, I know some, you know, we've had calls in the past where, you know, certain lakes were out of bounds and certain ones yeah. you'd go to a drop <laughs> zone. And it's like, it's just so weird, but it's like every course, I feel like every tournament runs into that problem. And so I just think we need somebody that, is standardized on the pro tour that isn't a TD isn't, and they just go through and look at all the different situations and come up with a set of rules that, like you said, are standardized. And so I think that's a lot of what our problems are is just standardization. A lot of different things, rules, baskets, all that, all those different things. So I think it's a growing pain right now that we're going through that we definitely need to get to the bottom of, cause it affects tournaments a lot. I mean, my thing that, is, my thing is like on the spectator side of things, like I, I, when I'm watching something and I don't know what's going on or I don't understand something, like it makes me less interested in continuing to watch it like sports wise. And so like, to me, if we're, if, if players are confused about what the rules are, you got to believe like spectators are. And like a lot of times, like spectators just don't even like the commentators don't even really know how to explain it to the people watching. So you're just like, Oh, I, I, okay. I guess Ricky gets to putt up there, <laughs> right. uh, but and and like to add on that, um, this this is another add on. I think another big mistake right now in disc golf course design is we all want to throw good shots. We are all trying to throw good shots, but sometimes we don't throw good shots. And sometimes a bad shot is punished, and sometimes a bad shot is not punished. And the perfect example of this is the bridge hole, hole number nine at Ledgestone. If you throw your shot one foot, like Gannon was just on here, he said that he threw his shot one foot out of bounds long. He had to advance 60 feet and have to throw another very, very tough shot. You go two holes later to hole number 11. If you throw your shot one foot out of bounds, do you know what you have to do? You have an you have, eight foot putt for par. <laughs> you have an eight. So both shots were bad. Both shots, yeah. players were not trying to throw those shots. I, to me, like, I, I just think that's, I, I would love to see both being punished. That's yeah. what I, I would like to see both being punished. Yeah. Like it's like you said, a drop zone where you still have to put a 30, 40 footer instead of eight feet. You're like, all right, cool. He's, you know, and of course you're not trying to throw it there, but it's, there's not much risk. Cause you know, if you do, you either park it or you're out of bounds eight feet from the basket. Okay. There's not much, there's no, there's, there's really no repercussion for a bad shot. You know, whereas, like you said, the other one, it's almost too much repercussion for a bad shot. The bridge hole, like you're saying. So it's like you need somewhere in between is to where you're throwing. Like if you throw a bad shot on the bridge hole, you're basically throwing the same shot again. 
from 50 feet in front of you. And so it's almost, you know, a double penalty kind of. What were hey, saying? Like, double penalty people, but this silly little drop zone putt thing that we invented over the last two years is the why worst do people thing like I've ever that? seen in my Why life. do people like the drop zone I putt? I don't know Stop why it. This, what, when this became a thing. <laughs> like you miss an island and now you get a putt. Wait, like, Yuli. That's crazy to me. Yuli, you'll it's love an this. Island. You'll love this. Final round. So I'm playing with AB, uh, a guy named Jakob, and then, oh gosh, who's the third guy I'm playing with? Wow, that's not good. But I'm playing with I'm playing with three, four people, okay? Three of us, <laughs> three of us land on the island on hole 18. One doesn't. 17. So we're on oh, 17. Thank you. So we're all standing, waiting for him to walk up to the drop zone to do the little 40 foot, 50 foot drop zone putt. There's probably 50 <laughs> people. There's probably 50 people or so around the basket. No one is watching him walk up there. No one's watching him putt. And so I, I audibly said out loud, I was like, thank God they changed to a drop zone putt. Look how exciting it is. Everyone's watching. They can't wait to see if he makes it. No one likes it. No one likes it. What? People, no people one wants like to watch right that. There and they make like a whole thing about it. Like, and Ma Maple Hill. It's cool for people to watch somebody miss the island and make the putt down the hill and they get all excited. When did we decide it was okay to miss an island and then go to a putting green? That's, that's insane to me. That, that means that me. Let's here. Here's my point. This is how silly this is. Somebody lands. Let's use hole eight at Maple Hill. No, Somebody do sixteen lands at shorts, do, never, do do sixteen at European Open because Ricky, we have to get his thoughts on the change yeah. there too. Yeah, okay, do sure. sixteen at European Open. Well, this I like, this, I like this one better, and then we can switch over to okay, because, we'll switch, because we'll switch, of we'll my point. Somebody throws their disc, it gets it, it, they're short, it's in the water, it's gone forever. Worst shot you've ever seen. Somebody <laughs> passes it and goes over the thing and slides underneath the wall. Okay? They both go to a putt. <laughs> How is that fair? Really? One was like pretty good, not the greatest shot. One he lost his disc forever, and they get to go to the same place. <laughs> and the guy, that, yeah, the and guy that threw in the water is a really good putter, so he right. pars it. And the yeah, other guy right. get pars. That's uh -huh. nuts, man. Yeah, no, right, it, it is 16, crazy. But, so, what would you say? Just every water carry and every island hole is just to throw it until you make it type sure. thing. Sure, or, or, or go I'm, to. I would rather that happen than everybody get a uh, a reward. Yeah, I would say, uh, I would say uh, go to a patient of reward. Uh, How you gonna go? <laughs> I would say go to putt. like a uh, go to like a two hundred. Like I, I actually think hole nine, the bridge hole. I think that's like a perfect uh, hole because you know it's a three hundred and twenty foot shot, but it's downhill, so it's not even really that long. And then if you go to the drop zone, it's like 280, 270. Like if you miss it, your next shot should be like way left, and then give your you know like. To me, it's like, I think we're all good enough to not sit at a 270 foot shot and like empty our bag. Right. Yeah, for sure. And so to me, I, I think it adds in like, I would have loved, I would have loved to see the battle between you and Gannon with 16. Yeah. I would yeah, have loved to have seen it. Sure. And, and it's like it where been. Gannon was at there. It's like, bro, like he knows he's got to force Ricky to basically what you did. You made an incredible birdie on 17 to put yeah. yourself even in chance. Right. But like, he just basically knew, like, I don't have to really do anything on whole. There's no real, I'm not scared. Right. I hate that. Yeah. Yeah. For sure. It took all the, you know, all the pressure off of that, that yes. upshot, which was like one of the most like nerve wracking upshots in disc golf. If you're in the hunt of that tournament, like to win, like, yeah. And so, yeah, it just it just made it feel completely different. It just was like, oh, like might as well just been a wide open shot with no, you know nothing in the way. There's no, like yeah. it just didn't have the same feeling because you know that hey, I don't I don't have to rethrow and my tournament's not going to be over if I miss the shot. Worst, yeah, bogey at worst, and a lot of times you you know there's a good chance you might make that par putt too. Mm -hmm. So well, seventeen at Maple or at seventeen at USDGC. Imagine if they just okay now you get a forty five footer. Right, it's the greatest the hole of all time yeah, where we've seen sure. the most drama and the coolest sure. stuff happen mm -hmm. and the coolest putts from Gannon and Paul to win that tournament. And now they're like, oh no, actually bogey at worst. Go ahead. There wouldn't be that many people that even missed the island. It like would, no, you, it's such like an if you easy know, shot. If you know you have a 45 yeah. footer, like the stress is like gone. 
Yeah, and the pressure of actually hitting it is gone too because you're yeah. not even really worried if you don't. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's, it's to me, it's just, it's a crazy thing. I don't know why we we are moving that way, but people love it. Yeah, um, I, I think like if you, it, it would be better if and I guess it still doesn't really solve your problem, Yuli. But like, it's if you had like instead of like Maple Hill, you had to still throw an upshot. You're not going to just have a chance for a par. You, you're getting a bogey. You just have yeah, to get one for that. It. Yep. You know, I'm yeah, time for that. Yeah, and so, but it, then it also is like sucks for the guy that threw it OB by two inches and has to go get a bogey from 120 feet away, you know? Yeah. So it's like, that's, that's just like somebody like his example of hole one. Yeah. Yeah. Like what's, what's the difference? Right. Yeah. You know, you know what I mean? Between the guy who went OB a thousand miles that way and he hits the embankment and he's out of bounds. Like what's the difference? The standardization needs to be better and we shouldn't just be giving people rewarding people with par putts. Yeah. Yeah, Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, no, I agree you're, you're putting a lot more emphasis on the putting there, which we already have a crazy amount of emphasis with, like you were saying, a lot of the greens we play, throw the disc. If you're a good putter, you can literally throw the disc 60 feet left, 60 feet right, 60 feet short, 60 feet long. Mm-hmm. That's, exactly. If you throw it in that, I mean, come on, what are we doing here? So Yeah, for sure. Um, all right, we're all pretty fast players. Ricky, you're probably one of the fastest players. So let's <laughs> talk a little pace of play. One of my favorite combo so i'm teeing off on hole one final day and here comes casey white uh gosh two other players can't remember who they were they're coming off a hole 18 and they're all jazzed up being like we're done baby and like they played their round in like an hour and 50 minutes and they're going nuts and i basically again audibly i i was i was on one i would say at ledgestone i was i was letting it fly to the crowd and uh, I basically said something like, oh, my gosh, it's crazy how a threesome can play this course in, in two hours faster, an hour and a half faster than everyone else. Why do you think we haven't tried going to threesomes yet? Because also that eliminates me and Yuli saying, Ricky, I think you're out of bounds. And then Ricky and AB saying, no, I think he's in bounds. And now right. there's a tie. 50-50 split. Yeah. There's like, why have we not tried that? What, what what is what is the reasoning behind not I, trying threesomes? I think it's probably they can can't fit as many people in the tournaments for tea times. Like as you, like right now, so like in Europe we're teeing off. In Europe's not as big of a deal because there's sunlight, but like in the states, people are like lead cards are teeing off at what three four o'clock. So it's like if you have threesomes, you're having those couple extra groups, maybe five or ten extra groups, and it adds an extra hour or two. So sunlight becomes an issue. So I'm just guessing that that might be an, a part of the problem is the amount of people being able to fit in the tournament and, and under the tee times that we play with now instead of shotgun starts. So why uh, are they scared of having people go off of one and 10 at the same yeah, time? Right. That, that would solve that problem. I'd be all for that for sure. Yeah, why but do you for think, some reason why do you think they don't do want to do that? I don't know. That is weird. I think it may be more staffing. I don't know. I, I really don't know for sure. Like, but You being on lead cards a lot, right? Would you be opposed to, uh, th- let's say in, in a four round tournament Thursday, you're teeing off at like nine 30, but you're on a feature card. Yeah. And then Friday comes around, you play with the same people and you play in the feature card spot. Cause you had a morning tea time. And then on Friday you have an afternoon tea time. So you basically have feature cards playing in the morning and the mm-hmm. afternoon. They film the ones in the afternoon. And then the next day they just flip flop. Like, would you be yeah. opposed to doing that? No, I th- I think that would be fine. I think that would be totally fine. I I I really like it. I think we so we did that in Europe actually because we had a bunch of weather delays, and so was it round two and round three, we actually played with the same groups. Uh, so 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 round two started. We had a big weather delay and we had to come and we could they couldn't do the shuffle, so we had to come back at seven a.m. the next day, finish our round two, and then play round three. So that's basically what we did. But it was that was really weird because. That was like towards the end of the tournament where like, you know, the pressure was start of a major championship yeah. was starting to creep in and like that a whole round, you got a whole round basically of like not having to deal with pressure. Like for like the top groups, like I think Randon was in the top group and like he had, he didn't sense. shoot very good round two. He was like, you know, he shot like three, four over par and he was still on the lead card, you know, fifteen strokes off the lead, playing <laughs> yeah. with, you know, Macbeth and a couple <laughs> other people who were actually in the hunt. So it's kind of created this really weird dynamic. And that was obviously, you know, what you're saying would never happen because it's only for round one and round two. Then you do the shuffle that happened to get pushed all the way to round three. So you're getting near the end of the tournament where, you know, the pressure starts creeping in. You're playing with lead cards and all the galleries and all that comes along with that. 
Um, but uh, so that was a unique dynamic. But yeah, I don't. I think that you know, there's just there's so much that gets thrown at the pro tour. I think right now that it almost feels overwhelming for them. And mm. just from you know, it's like you got all right, you got baskets. What are you gonna do with the tee pads? What are you about this and that? And it's like, and so I think we need to also make like a you know some sort of a list of what's the most important immediately for next season and then and then that way we can get that done and and then work our way down the list of things that we all you know majority of players can agree on that needs to be done you know and i so i think that that's could that's part of the problem right now is that there's just so much being said and it's all very good points and it's all things i'm sure they want to change but it's not going to be a you know if they're too overwhelmed they're not going to be able to do anything so this is a good question by Philip for you guys. Would it bother you to play not in the order? So you're not playing anymore hole one through hole 18 like the course was designed. Uh, going out and starting on hole 10 and then finishing on hole nine. Would that have any don't bother to you all. guys? Yeah, I don't I don't really care. Yeah, I don't care either. I, okay. I don't, yeah, I don't think, I think most players wouldn't. I mean, it really doesn't. I mean, it, it does change a little bit, like like what you said, like hole 17 at USDGC. You're coming down the stretch. You know, that's a very important hole. So, you know, playing that as hole eight or whatever you'd play it is a little bit different, you know. Mm-hmm. But at the same time, it's just, you're playing all the holes. It really Happens doesn't make that much traditional difference. Golf. Yeah, for sure. And, and that's the thing. It's like the final day and the final two days, it, you know, that's when it really yeah. matters the most when you're coming down the, you know, yeah. the, the final stretch. So, yeah, you know, I think it really doesn't, you know, because especially if you're making the cut, you know, like what I think most people want is having a cut, you know, but then you need the four round events. But I think did they, they did a cut at Ledgestone, right? Yeah, but it's yeah. after three rounds. I don't know why yeah. they keep doing three round. Right. Cuts. I know that I is don't. super weird. I, yeah, it should just be two. Yeah, because yeah. there's some people that are like 45 over par right. after after two rounds. <laughs> yeah, and it's like, like, what is, like yeah, cut those sure. guys loose, brother. Yeah, exactly. Oh. <laughs> right. There's there's nothing to play for. Yeah, for sure. No. Yeah. I mean, hey, mad respect too to all the people that don't DNF and still show up and play for the fans and all that <laughs> stuff. Because no, it, it is. I've been in that spot. It's really tough to be like. Bro, I'm I'm so I have to shoot 26 under par to make the cut. Like what? <laughs> what are we doing? Like, yeah, right. what yeah, are we doing? Yeah, for sure. Um, uh, but what do you do with like three round events, dude? How do you have a cut after like one round? Like, no, then, there rounds. I would do two rounds as okay, well. Yeah, yeah, I would yeah. do in the final round two rounds. Yeah, the yeah. final round just the 46 people and and stop making it to where my boy Ezra has to play four rounds and then not make money. Stop that. <laughs> <laughs> Stop that. That is crazy. Well, what are we doing? Pay everyone. Right. Pay everyone that makes the cut. Stop For it. Sure. Yeah, they've um, always done that. They've always done like I think they've like, done oh, let's sneak three spots. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what? So if someone plays bad enough, they they still don't make money, even though like, like a lot yeah. of times in your head you're thinking like, oh cool, I made it. Like I got I got nothing to lose. I can't lose anything. Well, actually, you can. <laughs> yeah. You play bad it's, enough. <laughs> yeah, it's terrible. Um. Yeah. All right, last thing I want to talk about with you on Ledgestone here. Uh, did you see the video with the spotter? And yeah, double I saw G's the, Garrett, roller. the Garrett Roller video. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so my initial, when I heard it, my initial thought was he probably was like a deer caught in headlights. Yeah. And he was like, oh, crap. And then where he's standing is actually where you want the spotter to stand because they they have the best view on where the disc sure. goes out of bounds. Yeah, it is a little dicey because like three four feet behind him is also the OB line for hole thirteen. Right, and you might not know if people are throwing in whatever. But initially, I was thinking like he was just like oh crap and mm-hmm. like got stuck. The more I watch it though, <laughs> I I think he was trying to have it go between his legs. That's kind of what I've been thinking too. Like, I think he's then, trying to line up for the old one, two, sure. right between the legs. <laughs> and then like hit a, hit a root or something, right? And that's it what popped, popped up. up. Yeah. yeah. And, that, and that's, and then that was, that was just, that was crazy how it just worked out like that. But I think you're right. I think he was trying to get cute and get it, get it to go through his legs and look cool and give him the green flag. Like he was supposed to get yeah, wave, <laughs> pull out the Jedi, yeah. the, yeah, je, exactly. the Jedi lightsaber yeah. and start like going that, that crazy. The coolest green flag ever. It, it yeah. looked to me like he lost it for a second. Cause there's that tree there. And then no. it looked like it might hit the tree. Mm-hmm. And so I think he didn't know what was going on. And then all of a sudden it's right there in front of him. 
<laughs> and I thought he was trying to do the whole jump over it and just caught him right in the chest. <laughs> yeah, because some people, because some people were like, he needs to get way out of the way, and it's like, where's he gonna go? They, they don't know that if yeah. if you go a couple, if he goes a couple feet behind him, he's in the fairway of another right. of another exactly. hole, yeah. and he doesn't know what's going over there. Um, but yeah, no, I thought I thought that was kind of that was kind of cool. But Yuli, didn't we go over a rule? that double G could have rethrown for free, right? No penalty. Didn't we go over that rule on here? I heard that, someone say that. Is that a real thing or no? I feel yeah, like it's not. We, Cause it was the no. uh, Madison. It was the Madison rule where the spectator or the, the, the guy in the water jumped out and grabbed her disc. <laughs> you remember that OTB? Mm -hmm. And we basically <laughs> said, we looked up and there was a rule to you where can you can rethrow interference. Really? Is that only if it's in the air? It's got to be if it's if the disc is still moving. I feel like right. inner... Yeah, I don't know. I thought the same thing when I first saw it. Oh, I, there's I a thought... gray area in the rule? That's crazy. See, yeah. there might... Yeah, yeah, I know, right? Because <laughs> you got to think, like, if, 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 Ricky, if you're throwing, like, a forehand skip shot... Yeah. ...and it skips off the ground OB, and uh -huh. it's flying back inbounds, and someone yeah. jumps up and spikes it down OB... <laughs> right. I feel like that's the same exact thing as if someone jumped out of the, you know, and grabbed your disc out of the air without it hitting the ground. Is it not? Maybe it's like an intentional thing. Like you have to intentionally try to swat it. Like that, that one was intentional. guy. He, he chest bumped it. You <laughs> well, he was trying to get what? out of the way. This other guy like went up and grabbed it, tried to grab oh, yeah. it. You know what I mean? I don't know if that's part of it. I'm just spitballing here. Yeah, yeah. no, it's, it's that, that might be a tough one, but I, <laughs> I would have definitely been fighting for that intentional interference for sure. That was, that, was, that would have been that I was would have been really live. I'm like, oh no, this <laughs> poor guy. And then you know he felt so bad. Oh. Like, yeah. The problem is like, I mean, what does that guy do like at league that week? <laughs> right. He's like that Cubs guy that caught the rules. <laughs> yeah. ball. Like, he can't go any league without just getting harassed. The only He's thing is my it, favorite it, player's roller, dude. What are you doing? Yeah, the <laughs> only thing is at least it wasn't like on lead card, and at least it didn't have like implications for like someone winning a tournament or not. Yeah. That would have been was lead card, actually. Was it? Yeah. He, was, he yeah, that, Double G was, was on right? lead card. Oh, he was yeah. on lead card. He played good the yeah. Oh, you're right. Oh, okay. Well, I mean, okay. I guess it good it wasn't lead card First final round. round. Yeah, yeah, second, yeah. Round. second round. Yeah. Jeez. Yeah. Crazy <laughs> stuff. Yeah. Well, hopefully, uh, hopefully everything goes fine for him. <laughs> um, oh, I, I lied. I, there is one more thing. What are we doing with T signs, guys? <laughs> How do we not get the distance correct on T signs? Oh yeah, it's funny. It's crazy. Well, well, the, I thought you were going to talk about like the placement of them. Like I've seen uh, Jake oh. Wolf throw a forehand right into <laughs> one of them because he throws obviously very <laughs> unique forehand shots. So he actually threw. It was a. Uh, I forget what course it was, but he like, it was a, just a normal T sign with the, you know, sponsors and all that looked all right, but it was like relatively not in the way, but he like, he literally like scraped and hit the T sign right in front of him, like literally like two feet in front of him and just stopped. <laughs> well, did Goose crazy. get like a framed, he got one of his Mando signs framed or something. Cause he cracked it in half. Oh yeah. That was Goss. Did you guys see yeah. that? Goss. Yeah. And, uh, and that was in Estonia, I think. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's incredible. That, <laughs> that did you see crazy. that Yuli? Yeah, that's that's all. That's, that's, sign and have. Yeah, mm -hmm. I'm gonna be right back. Well, hold on, my dogs are freaking out. I'll be right back. <laughs> uh, What's your what like what rule right now on the tour do you think about? And you're like, I don't even know why that why that's a thing. Um, let's see here. The five minute rule. <laughs> yes, <laughs> that didn't take long. The five minute rule. <laughs> Oh, cool! You gotta be about, there five let's, let's go back before. to the old school way. Either you show up to your tea time or you don't. <laughs> that's, <laughs> that's pretty unique. Nice. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And if you don't, you have thirty seconds to show up, and that's it. Like yeah, I've I've said this before. I don't know why. Like it's like the m most enforced rule out of anything. It's like we're gonna double down on right. this one. This yeah, is the one. We want to stroke you before you even yeah, show up. <laughs> exactly. Right. This is an about, entertainment business. And Focus let's, on the, yeah. let's stroke them before it even starts. Let's give <laughs> yeah. them two. Right. Well, focus on the rules that actually affect the play once you start the event. Yeah. Now, once it's, right? Yeah. <laughs> once you say not go. The five it's the difference before, between yeah. like getting like that or like you not adding your scorecard up right. Like, oh, yeah. 
I get that. Like it's pretty simple. Well, you don't, but you, not you showing don't, you, up five minutes before your tea time. Come on. Yeah. Come on. No, I know. You don't. You don't have to add your scorecard up. They give you the trophy before you even have. You even do that. So oh, you don't. True. It yeah. doesn't even matter. <laughs> You've already won the tournament. Yeah, Ricky. <laughs> someone that's won a lot of tournaments. Let me ask you this question. What are your thoughts on that? How do you think the end of a tournament should go? Yeah. Uh, so so basically, yeah. I mean, well. The end of the tournament goes about just like, just like for everybody, like you really don't get any time, like just like you would if there's, you know, you're finishing around and you go have a line of people, you don't get any sort of time to relax or like chill out for a second. You got to immediately go do an interview or do something. Or How do you sign think it should go? Um, I just, well, I, th- I, th- it's tough to answer that because it's like the expectations of of the fans and everybody that wants you to do things. That's really what dictates how it goes. Like, Hey, this guy wants you to do this. This guy wants you to do this. And if you say no, then you're like, you screw up the whole operation of potentially DGN. Cause they planned on you doing an interview and you need to take five or 10 minutes to chill and like relax, which is understandable after grinding out a, a tournament in front of, you know, all the mental capacity it takes and all that stuff. And so it's more the pressure of the fans and the media and all the other stuff that they put on you that, that make you feel obligated to do certain things that you really aren't in the right mental mindset to maybe do at that time. It doesn't mean you don't want to do it, but it maybe means you need five, 10 minutes to take a drink, go chill. And, you know, in Estonia, we had like a locker room where we could just go away and just, they had security That's guarding right. there. So nobody could go and like bother you. And so go chill on a beanbag chair that they had in the, you know, players room lounge and then come back and do an interview, you know, and it kind of be a little bit refreshed. If you like that more like the Estonia, how, and then how at the end, how they put you guys up on, and there was actually a podium. Yeah, that was really cool. They did champagne. It kind of reminded me like an F1. They had like fireworks yeah. you know, going off. They had champagne. They played the national anthem. And, you know, if, of course, oh, whoever, awesome. you know, if a different country would have won, I'm sure they would have played their national anthem. But, um, but yeah, it was, it was really cool. I think they just did, they did a really professional job. That was probably the most well put together event from start to finish that I've ever played. And it's not even really close. The, yeah. The, I mean, and like the, you guys all saw the whole one. You basically got, now they had smoke. Oh, you could do sick. your little celebration yeah. or whatever. Like, and then everyone clapped and people were waving, you know, Estonian flags and the, whatever, you know, country flags. And so, yeah, it's just this, that whole, ex, the experience was what made it. The course was, was good. It wasn't great, but the course was good. And it was, I mean, like you said, for one example, they eliminated the roller guy getting hit potential because there was literally five to 10 feet on each side uh, past the out of bounds. There was, there was fences to where they couldn't, they could get close and get a great view, be right there, but yet they're also far away. So they're not within 10 feet of the playing surface of the out of bounds. So so that, you know, and that's every single hole. And then uh, they doubled that, doubled down with that, with putting, let's say, Nike sponsored hole 10. And then they had uh, Sportland, which is like their version of uh, Dick's Sporting Goods type thing. And they had, you know, all the fencing had Sportland, Nike, you know, Nike, yeah, uh, Estonia, all that. Well, each company was a different hole. And then they doubled it with, like I said, using it as a fence and a sponsor for video coverage and all that. So it's just everything like that was so well put together. And, um, yeah, they utilize the space really well as far as the course design, the sponsors airtime, like I said, with all the stuff I was saying and the player experience, the spectator experience, they had VIP areas and it was, yeah, I, I would honestly say if I wasn't a disc golfer and I, I would have had a blast going yeah, there yeah. if I had not, you know, if I, even if I didn't know anything about disc golf and it would have been fun experience. Yeah, and that's, it, that's what it we looks need. sick. It looks sick for sure. And like I said, uh, I think I said this like last week or I don't know when I said, I said on a podcast though, if you would have removed all the infrastructure there, it would have looked very similar to Memorial. It's, that's very true. It, yeah. it re- there wouldn't mm-hmm. have been that much difference between those two. And so true. everyone looking at Memorial, you're like, wow, you're playing in a park. People are like walking their dogs around for sure. you yeah, and stuff. No. And then there all of a sudden it looks super legit. So, right. So, and, and that's a very realistic thing that we can do. Like that's very possible. It took, yeah. it takes a lot of effort and, and I'm sure lots of planning, all that stuff, but it's very doable. Like as obviously they did it in a, in a country of one. And that's another thing is I don't think there was only like 1.5 million people there, but I think it's actually somewhat easier, you know, in a country that that's small because they just don't have as much stuff going on as they far as get behind it. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And that's kind of just how it is. Like Kristen's playing good disc, obviously high level, one of the best player in the world. And so everyone wants to play disc golf now, but like, 
like five, 10 years ago, there was a tennis player that was playing really well in Wimbledon and all the big events in tennis. And so there was a big tennis boom in Estonia. Mm. So I think that, that that's a big thing they got going for them is that they can have this influence real quickly, like what Kristen's doing. And so then you have all these disc golf fans and people who want to help and all that stuff that comes along with that. And so they took full advantage of that and they're going to next year with the major that they're going to have. And I'm sure it'll be what, from what I've heard, bit better and bigger based on the crazy. course design and all the things that they, and that's the thing is they felt they made notes of stuff that they did. They need to do better. And, you know, obviously the players, you wouldn't be able to see it from an outsider standpoint, but they're, they made notes and they're going to get better next year. So yeah, it's highly recommend going there uh, and playing just strictly for, you know, the event and the experience, the everything that comes along with it. Last thing I'll say about the trophy ceremony from an outsider looking in, it looks like, uh, you know, you've got Seinfeld or something coming on at eight and it's seven fifty eight, and Ricky's putting. And they're like, we, we got a minute and a half to wrap this up. We got to go quick. That's, that's just the, the feel of it is it feels very rushed and very fast. And to me, I would love there to be more of a basically reverse everything that they're doing. They, they throw a trophy on you. They announce you to the crowd, you get an interview and then you get like this highlight package and all the story and all that stuff. I would love to see that reversed. I would love to see uh, after you win, show you walking to the scores tent. Sometimes that's like you, it's a nice walk with all the crowd around you. Yeah. You're giving high fives. That would be a six shot. And then while you're doing the scores and all that stuff, um, then show the highlight package, show how you got there. Then that's like two or three minutes. Then they pull you out and they have like a legitimate celebration. You've had some time to decompress. You could probably will give a much better interview and do it that way. I, I think that would look a lot better. And uh, For sure. you know, who am I? Is, is that just how every other sport does it? Yes. But should we do it that way? Probably not. <laughs> <laughs> no no for sure i think that that is definitely so the way they did it i think that uh, for some reason the it, it, it wasn't rushed in person i think maybe on video it felt like it but in in person they did a good job planning it out what are you talking about and, which tournament oh the estonia oh i'm not talking i think estonia oh, I actually you. did a good job i'm talking about like Literally any you. tournament in the States. I got where... you. Any other tournament <laughs> besides Estonia. That's That's true. Okay, your your final you. putt's in the air, and yeah. the TD is sprinting to oh, yes. you with the trophy. <laughs> For sure. No, I, I hear you. can't <laughs> wait. You, that, that's well, what I'm have talking about. They trophy get some air time, you know? <laughs> I guess. I don't know. If people are going to stick around two minutes or three minutes to listen to what you have to say, then I don't know. I don't know what to tell you. <laughs> but that, that's, that's to me, it just feels a little rushed. And my whole thing is like, I, sure. I'm kind of devilish, devilishly like wishing someone messes up their scoreboard or scorecard. So then you have this like Steve Harvey moment where we all like congratulate the winner. And it turns out they actually didn't win because they signed the wrong scorecard. <laughs> and then like someone else won or something, you know, that's like, actually I, happened before. I kind of want that to happen. Didn't Schustrick do at the, uh, speaking of the Memorial, I think Schustrick did that. And then he actually he had really, to playoff with paul and he still won though didn't he yeah he still won but yeah yeah but he had to actually go into a playoff because he signed his scorecard wrong and then he had to go to he luckily it was it was paul and schustrick a while back at the memorial but yeah he ended up winning in the first playoff hole but <laughs> that, that would have been crazy to win but then actually lose at the same time <laughs> well speaking of a uh, last thing i want to touch on here speaking of like a battle what was it like kind of going toe to toe with paul Macbeth like that I think a lot of people really enjoyed watching you two guys go back and forth. Like obviously you've had uh, a lot of success over the last couple of years. Paul's kind of had some success here and there over the last couple of years, but we haven't really seen you guys separate yourself from the field. So like, what was that kind of going back and forth? Yeah. I mean, it was, it was, it was an amazing, you know, energy. I mean, I think that, you know, all, all the players on the lead card knew that, Hey, you have to bring it today. We got Paul, we got me, Gannon, and then there was who was there was I forget the last uh, blanket on the the last player. But, it was Klein and Proctor, I think. No, the, no, no, no. It was Kyle Klein and I think was Kyle on that. Yeah, Kyle was, was he on the lead card? Yeah, because he open? hurt okay. his shoulder or something. Oh, yeah, yeah. Well, that was was that European Open or that was no, that was uh, yeah Estonia. You're right. Yeah, yeah. Um, but um, but yeah. So we just kind of knew that you had to you know, you're going to have to play well. That course set up to get a lot of birdies, and so. Yeah, it was, it was, it was, 
and awesome that it, that it was setting up to be a Paul Ricky battle. I think that, you know, the, the crowd wanted it. You could just kind of feel the energy building up for what, for what the battle was about to turn into. And he played really well. He played, you know, he, he put the pressure on. Luckily I was able to build a lead the first day and kind of, that was, like I said, when I kind of hurt my shoulder. So I was just kind of limping into the finish and he was not, he was fully ready to go and putting the pressure on me and, you know, throwing good shot after good shot. And so that's just the kind of competitor he is. He, he's not going to, if, if he's anywhere near the lead, you're going to have to play well to win. Uh, otherwise he's going to catch you. So it's not like you're just going to, you know, have a couple stroke lead. And if he's within four or five, that's, that's manageable for, for him. And, and, and he knows that he knows how to put pressure on. I think that's something that's super important. Some players, maybe four or five back and they're just playing disc golf. You know, he's four or five back and he's putting, he's playing to put pressure on you in throwing the shot after shot and making you make shots and make those clutch pressure putts to, to not lose a stroke or, you know, and so that starts building on people and start people start not being able to handle the situation. Hey, he hit a longer putt than me. He threw, he's putting the, you know, he's making me, he's making a long putt then making my 30 footer feel a lot harder than, than what I was expecting it. So all the little things he does that, that are, you know, people may not see that he does really well. And he does it on purpose because he knows that, you know, putting someone under a high pressure situation is a lot more likelihood to miss, miss their shot and him get the stroke that he wants, you know? And so all that stuff is, is, is something that he's really good at and he did a really good job of it. And it's something you, you just learn over the years. You gotta, you gotta get to a high level and play in those situations week in and week out and year in and year out to feel, start feeling comfortable under those high pressure situations. And, and uh, yeah, that was a really fun moment. How nice was it that he missed that putt on 18? <laughs> it was super nice. I was, I was bummed for sure. Like, how, um, and most, like, because my, my shoulder was shot. Like, it was really not good. <laughs> and I was, like, really not wanting, because, you know, like, I had missed a couple putts not being able to lift my arm. And I was, like, I was, I, I pitched that thing up so fast under the basket. <laughs> uh, but, um, but yeah, I mean, if, if I had, I, you know, I would have, it would have been a, a tough putt for me for the situation that I was in at that time. Sure. Um, and uh, so, yeah, I mean, even hole 18 is not that easy. It's a tough hole. There's out of bounds and there was wind and, and obviously the pressure that, 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 that was there. And so, yeah, it was, uh, it Did was you nice. Think he not, was going to make it. And yeah, then of it course, looked like, it out of his hand. Yeah. Yeah. Like I thought he was like walking down. I was like expecting to have to make my putt. And we were about the same distance. So he, once again, that, that moment that I was talking about, like he was going first, so he's going to be able to put the pressure on, like he wanted that. And so, so he was 30, you know, two feet. I was like 28 feet. And so, yeah, he, you know, he, if he made it, all the pressure was on me when to it, have to make mine. When it came out of his hand, did you, were you like, oh, that's dead center? Yeah. yeah. Like it started high, <laughs> like a nice high putt do, does. And it like normally drops in, but then I think the headwind just kind of yeah. held it up in the air longer than he thought and hit the top. Um, and so, <laughs> yeah, I, I'm sure it wasn't really necessarily a bad release. I think the wind just held it up a little more than he thought. Um, but, uh, you, you think there's different styles of play like that? Like you're, you're talking about him. Who's just going to put a lot of pressure, a lot of pressure on, but then you have, you know, like the new generation Gannon and it seems like, to me when I watch and I give the eye test, he's doesn't get as affected as a lot of players. And he might be special in that regard. Obviously he is because of the success that he's having, mm -hmm. but like, let's say you like European open, for example, like you're putting pressure, putting pressure and you finally wear him down and you get within striking distance. You know what mm -hmm. I mean? He misses right. that putt on 17. That's right. the first time I've seen him kind of crack under the pressure for in sure. all of his wins that he has. Can you speak yeah. to like, do you think that that's just like maybe a, his style or is it a new generational thing to where they're like, Oh, I don't care about these old heads anymore. Like I'm better than them. You right. Know? Yeah. No, I, th I think that it's um, partly his style, but I think partly it's um, it's, he's just getting real comfortable, you know, cause he's in, he's on lead card every week. So it's like, you can't get any more pressure than that. So he's just kind of, you build point. Uh, not really an immunity to it, but you kind of do like, it's, it's like, just like somebody, let's just, pick a random player that's first rookie a rookie on the pro tour. They don't play very well. And all of a sudden at the world championships, the final day, they're on lead card. Of course, they're going to be extremely nervous. And the, and, and the, and the top players behind them are going to be super pumped. That's Joe Schmoes in first. And they have three <laughs> yeah. back going in the final round of the yeah. world. It's like, this guy's got no chance to win, you know, yep. <laughs> even though he's winning, like, and so, so I think that he just kind of has built this 
some so-called immunity to the pressure. Nobody's immune to it, but you have this tolerance to where it doesn't affect you as much sure. as the next guy, the, the Joe Schmo at Worlds. Uh, and so I think that that makes a big difference uh, executing your shots and not letting it affect you in a negative way. And so I think he's starting to feel that and he deserves it for putting himself in that situation. As you always hear people say, like your first lead card, you're probably not going to play great, but you're going to, you're going to learn a lot. You're going to learn how to handle that pressure mentally, physically, all that stuff and learn your tendencies under the, with, with the nerves and the pressure on you. And that way, when you step into the, Next lead card, you're you know you're building off of that, and so you do that enough times, and you start feeling comfortable. And so yeah. I think that's exactly where he's at. Is you still get nervous, and I get nervous. I've been on a ton of lead cards. Paul, same thing. There's still nerves there. Oh yeah. But um, but yeah, some people are more. I don't know. That's probably not the best word for it, but immune to it oh, to a certain great, extent. Yeah, it's great yeah. analogy. There, there might also be like a little bit of like he's just kind of in his own world too. Mm-hmm. <laughs> like a, he's yeah. got like in La La Land a little bit. Yeah, he's just thinking about building Legos like, and yeah, yeah and making fifty kid. footers. Yeah, like he's <laughs> chicken like, nuggets. <laughs> there might be a little bit of that of where, um, yeah, he's he's just out there having fun. Um, it will the the interesting thing that will be fun to watch is like what does he do. I mean, he could just continue to be great, right? He could. But there's also a real good chance that he has like a little bit of a slip up, right? And there, oh, yeah. he gets close to winning and he loses one. And he gets close to winning again, he loses. And all of a sudden, questions start, well, what's going on? Has he gotten worse? Like, that's when I think it will get really interesting to see like what, how has he handled that? Yeah. And I, th- I think that that's kind of, that's professional sports in a nutshell is there's always going to yep. be ebbs and flows and it's the players that can snap out of the lows and, and still come back. And I think that, you know, of course he's young, you know, young enough to where he really hasn't had to face the adversity. And for the most part, I'm sure he has in his own ways, but you know, like you said, to, to play off what you're saying is that, yeah, the players that do that, and, and consistently, you know, come back from that low that they have to kind of find some, find some success again. And then, and, and so, you know, I've maybe had five or 10 of those ebbs and flows in my career. And I'm sure yeah. Yuli's had a bunch. Macbeth's had a ton of them. Even when you're playing your best disc golf, sometimes an injury happens or like a one shot here or there really messes with your head or something for whatever reason. And so there's these little things that can throw you off. You airball one putt into the water and all of a sudden, next thing you know, you're like, hey, do I putt too hard? Like, <laughs> um, you know, like I know it's happened to me. Like I changed my putting style after like three putting way too many times in a tournament. Like, yeah. And so so there's just, yeah, you're just always growing and you're yeah. always changing. And I think that that's what makes a good player is being able to adjust to what your game has that day, that week, that year, because you may throw a little further. You may be, you know you know, hyzering your, you know, hyzering out a little bit more one day versus the next. So there's so many variables that come into being a professional disc golfer. That's just all about how you can handle that and how you can not, you know, even if you play bad, you still got to keep your confidence and know that you can do it. Even if you didn't do it, you know, you can do it in the future. And so I think that's important. I think we saw that a little bit this year with AB when in the first, you know, three out of however many tournaments and then he went on a bad streak and I was, I was actually real worried about it. I'm like, okay, Mm -hmm. Like, how is he going to bounce back? He gets that one in Des Moines. And that showed me yeah. kind of a lot of being For like, sure. okay, he's actually here to stay. Mm-hmm. He's not just going to, you know, get on this crazy little streak and then, you know, get 20th every single time. Like, right. Exactly. That, that, you can see a lot in a player who does, does or works through those um, complications like that. For sure. Yeah, absolutely. Um, all right, Ricky, before we let you go, anything you got coming through the pipeline, any new discs, sponsors, the shout out, what also, yeah, no, also just... I'm also team cart gang now as well. So Heck yeah, nice dude. Team what cart made you gang. turn? Uh, my back, my back is, <laughs> my, my, back. <laughs> my back is, I've always been wondering like, why is my back hurt so freaking bad? And yeah. as soon as I switch to the cart, it's, it, I can actually practice and then practice the next day. Really? Where before so I was having, oh, massive difference. Yeah, okay. massive difference. Okay. Yeah. I mean, for me, it's just like an energy thing. Like, hey, it just saves energy. You don't have to pick up yeah. and put down, you know, however many times. But, um, but yeah, just thank my sponsor, Dynamic. Check out, I've been doing practice round videos on YouTube. So I'm going to be doing one, not this week, but I'm going to be doing one at Worlds. So I'm excited for that. I'll be doing a practice round video on my channel for that. And um, yeah, other than that, just, uh, practicing day in and day out getting ready for the world championships. Thanks everyone for tuning in and, and watching. Thanks 
Brody for having me and Yuli. I'm glad to be here and I'm excited um, for the next opportunity to be on here. And uh, thanks again, guys. Yeah, awesome, there's, a, there, there's a little chatter right now. Before we let you go, there's a little chatter about sports cards. Are you are you starting <laughs> to dip your toe a little bit in the sports? Are you getting ready for the disc golf uh, sports cards coming out? What's what, what's yeah. that looking like? Heck yeah, dude. I was I was I was opened some cards today. I was I was just bored and went to the local card shop and bought some uh, Donruss optic box. That's what I bought. There you 2023. Go. Yeah. So I didn't, I didn't hit anything too crazy, but, um, it's a fun little, fun little gamble to do. What do you got there? A little, a little gold tank oh, Dell tank Dell rookie. Wow. Yeah, that's 10, solid card. That's, look at this, that's look at this solid. bad boy. Just pulled oh, look this at you the guys. other day. Oh, we're big. We're big Who's in the that? sports cards. This is Dylan, dude. I Dylan, Dylan, I can't, Dylan I couldn't tell. Yeah. That's sick. Auto <laughs> auto too. Where'd yeah. you, would you get, did you get that off the Bowman? Yeah. Nice, dude. That's yeah, so we'll, after, we'll, we'll definitely I, I bought three packs, and that was my big hit. Was that people, that's amazing? People have been wanting me to do uh, some breaks and openings with other people on tour. So yeah, maybe at Worlds we'll find a time to get some. Yeah. Uh, Is there card get, shops there? There's a books a million that sells some. Uh, that's pretty much it. There's not really like a big card shop. We'd we'll probably have to, have to order go some to, online and do it. Yeah, I have to order some, but uh, but yeah, that'll be fun. Um, that would be. I think everyone's really excited about disc golf. I think what Brixton is doing is incredible. Yeah, um, I think you so. Know, whether you like gambling or not, I think like even like sports gambling, I think gets a lot of people interested in sports, but I also think sports cards also gets a lot of people interested because there's been people that I've pulled who I'm like, I have no idea who this is, yeah. but it's a sick card. And now I'm like watching that person play rooting <laughs> for them yeah. being like, come on, right. get, you know? And so I think all these things definitely help kind of get more people interested in the pro side of this golf. So I, a uh, big shout out to Brixton for what they're doing and for shout sure. out to you guys as well for doing the signings and all that. Cause it's, it's, it is a lot of work to have to sign all the cards and whatnot. For sure. So. Yeah. Do you think, uh, do you think people get like a lot of influencers on YouTube get, uh, like Panini to send them like loaded boxes and stuff to promote their cards? Yeah. I know so that's I'm, a big thing. So I'm pretty deep into the sports card world now. Um, I don't think loaded boxes like that do exist. I think, okay, what, I, was I, think curious. I think what happens is a, a lot of those, um, breakers, like the big ones, yeah. they, they have such a huge allocation that the chances of them getting a really good case in that allocation is, right. is, is, is massive. So and of course they're going to post and promote the one that has the biggest hits. They're not going to yeah. post a dud break, yeah. you know? And just to yeah. kind of, just to kind of show, like if you go on our Instagram and look at our first post to our post now, you will see the translate the the uh, the difference in when we first started po opening cards. We were opening like blasters, right? And Just then Walmart we boxes, yeah. Okay. And then we moved yeah. up to hobby boxes, and now we're opening cases of hobby boxes. And when you're opening cases of hobby boxes, you pull some really sick cards. So oh, yeah, for sure. So What's the most expensive card you pulled? I mean, I've I've pulled a uh, I've pulled a five digit card. Oh, five digit club, huh? Yeah, not That's for me. Not not for me. Yeah. The most okay. expensive card we have is like a twenty five hundred dollar card. Okay. Um, but we have pulled some like ten thousand plus dollar cards for wow. for people. So that's sick. Yeah, I mean it's that's it's fun. it's electric. But that, that, that is, is exhilarating. When you're opening that much product, that's you're going to get big cards like that. And so I think that's where a lot of people are like, man, these guys getting all the good cards. It's like, right. Well, well, they're opening you know a hundred and fifty hobby boxes. Right. Like they're Where's going. That? They're going Whereas to get some guy going to the local car shops, opening one box. Good luck. If that, yeah, exactly. Good luck. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. yeah I, I also, I always tell people too, like be very mindful of where you open loose boxes because you can weigh the boxes. And, um, and so like, if you want to be super shady, you can weigh the boxes and keep all the good ones for yourself and put all the bad ones out there for people to buy. So that's, that's why, like, that's why like I would never buy a loose hobby box on eBay. Mm -hmm. because also I can also open, let's say I have a, sorry, I don't know if people want to hear this, but we're, we're going to talk about it. Um, <laughs> let's say I have like a case of 10 hobby boxes, right? And there's a big card in the case. And let's say the third box I open has the big card. I then just sell the other seven. 
because I know the big card's already hit. Right, the case hit's gone. Yeah. Correct. So that's why it's always be a little wary when you're when you're buying that stuff. Check. So yeah, Check. that makes sense. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. That's but, crazy. Um, so yeah, where do you well, buy it from? Just the, straight from the retailer? So I have I have distributors now. Too. Okay. I, I, so you have I don't, accounts. Yeah, I don't have connections. You have to kind of be one of the good old boys to have a connection to actual Panini. Okay. Um, but I I have. I'm I'm one step closer well, to Benini. One so. step closer to the good old boys. Oh, that's correct. Cool. That's good. Correct. So we're slowly, <laughs> so good. we're slowly making it. So yeah, if you guys have any, if you guys have anything that you want to rip, let me know, and I'll try to get it for us, and we can maybe do some videos while we're. That'd be fun. That, okay. Be fun. Cool. Yeah. Little rips and boxes. So awesome. Heck yeah, but yeah. I'm splitting it with you because I'm not. If I pull something good, I'm taking that <laughs> bad boy home with me. <laughs> <laughs> do a little 2020 prism. Okay, um, okay. All right. That'd well, that's fun. sweet. And hey, that was fun. Hey, Ricky, it's always a blast. Thank I know guys, everyone, yeah. everyone that's listening always loves when you come on. They love your insight. They love the stories and all that stuff. And Appreciate uh, it. we wish you the best of luck. Now, I did say that we were expecting Gannon to win. But now I might be I might be saying I'm expecting you to win now. So <laughs> I'm expecting <laughs> one of you two to win. I so. think so. That's a good oh, We guess. missed you at Ledgestone, man. We needed I you know. there. You, I you know. two I are know. playing the best on the planet right now. And, and it was tough not to not to see you there. So I'm glad you're feeling better and look forward to watching you over there at Thank y'all. Thank y'all. Yeah, good luck, brother. Have a good one. Thanks, guys. We'll see you later. All right, later.